thanks to the uh, chairman and uh, all the members of the committee to uh, uh, having us here. So the speakers here uh, who have uh, experience of uh, investigating the organ housing of Falun Gong partition in China. So I'm going to just uh, briefly introduce the members and then uh, uh, of the speakers. Then I just pass on to them, let them speak what they have uh, investigated on. Uh, David Mattis is an international human rights lawyer living in Winnipeg of Canada. So since 2006, um, they were handed in some um, allegation um, by uh, a woman called Anne. Uh, her husband had an operation on removing eye corneas of over 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners when they were living in China. So in the end, they couldn't uh, take this pressure in, so they exiled to Canada and uh, you know, living there. So David then since t uh, then uh, started to investigate with the David Kilgore. Unfortunately, he can't be here with us today. Um, Ethan Gutman started his own investigation by interviewing a lot of uh, Falun Gong practitioners who were persecuted in labor camps and prisons in China. He, he, he did it parallel like, without knowing the two Davids were doing this investigation. So in the end, um, he'll tell you his conclusion. He found similar results with the two Davids. So it's not a coincidence he found. Uh, so he's going to say that afterwards. Zach Halu, uh, he's going to uh, say a few uh, suggestions of David Kilgore because uh, he has been with the talk uh, with David Kilgore for the talks recently. So uh, while I'm Falun Gong practitioner here, I've been uh, doing this for uh, since 1996 and. Uh, have been on the streets doing campaigns, contacting maybe all of you by my uh, emails, spamming you sometimes maybe. Uh, my whole purpose of being Falun Gong practitioner, being beneficial uh, from this practice, and I'd like to help people in China who can't enjoy the rights and freedom I do here. So uh, now I'm going to pass on to uh, David Mittens. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I, I um, have been involved, uh, as Dong Shu said, uh, in uh, investigating the issue, whether in fact Falun Gong are being killed for their organs. And uh, in uh, and we've written, David Kilgore and I, uh, two reports and a book on the subject. And then I co-edited a second book uh, with Torsten Trey, and Ethan Gutman has an essay on it. So there's a lot of material. Uh, and let me just say uh, uh, a few words about some of the evidence which led us to the uh, conclusion to which we came. Uh, one is the phone calls we had investigators make of uh, these in investigators pretended to be relatives of patients who needed transplants. They were calling Chinese hospitals. The, they were asking the hospitals if the Hospitals had organs of uh, Falun Gong practitioners uh, for sale on the basis that Falun Gong's an exercise regime, the Falun Gong would be healthy and their organs would be healthy. And we have uh, admissions on tape transcribed, translated throughout China uh, that uh, yes, we do have Falun Gong organs for sale. So that was uh, one bit of evidence. Uh, another is that we uh, talked to people who got out of prison and then out of China, both Falun Gong and non-Falun Gong alike. And uh, what they told us was that the uh, Falun Gong were being systematically blood tested and organ examined, and the non-Falun Gong were not. Uh, and that examination wasn't for their health because they were being tortured to recant. But it is necessary for organ transplants because you need blood type compatibility for transplants. A third uh, type of investigation is we talked to patients who'd been uh, to China and, and then uh, uh, came out of uh, China after the transplants. And uh, they told us there was secrecy, that there was heavy military involvement, uh, and also things were done quickly on order. Uh, they'd book their trips far in advance. Uh, they'd get transplants within a few days of, uh, of, of heart, of uh, liver, of kidney, uh, 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 of lungs. Uh, which meant that, well, except for kidney, where you can survive a that sort of transplant, people were being killed on order for their organs. 
Uh, the uh, an, another uh, uh, form uh, of uh, evidence uh, we looked at was the numbers. Uh, China is the leading uh, transplant volume country in the world after the United States, yet until recently it didn't have an organ donation system. And the one it does have now produces tiny numbers. Uh, and. Uh, so where were the organs coming from? Uh, eventually, the Chinese uh, admitted it was coming from prisoners, but uh, they said that it was prisoners sentenced to death and then executed. Well, how many are being sentenced to death and then executed in China? They, they won't say. But in light of the fact that there's no national organ distribution system in China, that people have to be executed within seven days of sentence, and uh, that there's a high hepatitis rate in the prison, you'd need about, in order to supply the volume of transplants they're doing, you'd need about 100,000 people sentenced to death and executed in China a year, which is plainly not the case. It's not even close. Uh, even the most uh, uh, largest estimates uh, are 5,000, 6,000 a year. So that there's no uh, plausible explanation for the sources of organs uh, that can explain the discrepancy between the volumes and the sources they identify. A, uh, a, a fifth uh, a factor that uh, concerned us was the extreme cover-up in which the government was involved. Uh, I mean, not only were they not disclosing death penalty statistics, which they never did, but they started destroying data as soon as we were quoting it. Uh, we started quoting the liver transplant registry uh, aggregate volumes, and they took that data down. We started quoting hospital websites. Uh, there are advertisements about prices of organs, about speed of organs, about the money they were making from organs. They were taking that down. We'd quote Chinese doctors, and uh, and, and then in the, the Chinese government would do videotapes saying they denied what we quoted them saying, even though their material was still posted on Chinese websites. And that cover-up highlights a, a phenomenon which, you know, whatever you think of our study, it doesn't fall to us to explain the sources of Chinese organs. It falls to the Chinese government to explain where they get these organs. That's the international standards, accountability, transparency, traceability, and they certainly do not conform to them. And the sixth and the final reason that we came to a conclusion that I'll mention here, although we have many more in our written materials, uh, is, is uh, the uh, absence of precautions that, that should be in place uh, to prevent this sort of abuse from happening. Those precautions are, were not in place in China, and they weren't in place anywhere else in the world. Transplant tourism was practically possible and not legally blocked, uh, or not even blocked by ethical standards when we started our work. So one of the things that David Kilgore uh, and I have been doing, and joined more recently by Ethan Gutman and others, is, is to urge uh, parliamentarians and policymakers around the world to put in place the mechanisms that would prevent this sort of abuse from happening. And those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ethan? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to participate in this profoundly important hearing. Uh, beginning in 2006, I began conducting comprehensive interviews with medical professionals, Chinese law enforcement personnel, and over 50 refugees from the Laogai system. That's black jails, that's labor camps, that's detention centers and mental hospitals and so forth. Uh, in order to piece together uh, really my own story, my own research on uh, how mass harvesting from prisoners of conscience evolved in China. And based on my research, and most of that research is available uh, right now, and I can, I'm happy to give references to people. Uh, 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 here's a short timeline. So in 1994, we know that organ harvesting of prisoners began in the 1980s. But in 1994, we have evidence that the first live organ harvests were performed on the execution grounds at Xinjiang in northwest China. In 1997, following the Gulja massacre, we have evidence that the first political prisoners, specifically Uyghur Muslim, ethnically Muslim uh, activists, were harvested on behalf of high-ranking Chinese cadres. In 1999, Chinese state security lost, launched its largest, uh, its largest action of scale since the, cult, the Cultural Revolution, which was the eradication of Falun Gong. By 2001, Chinese military hospitals uh, were unambiguously targeting select Falun Gong prisoners for organ harvesting. By 2005, overall transplant numbers and the refugees I've spoken to suggest that the numbers of Falun Gong who are being harvested increased dramatically. Uh, 
in early 2006, the Epic Times, a, uh, basically a newspaper that's largely practitioners, uh, Falun Gong practitioners, revealed the first charges of organ harvesting of Falun Gong. This was followed that summer by the distribution of the Kilgore Modest Report. In 2012, this man, Wang Li Jun, uh, attempted to defect at the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Two weeks later, information surfaced that he had overseen thousands of organ transplants while his boss was running the shop in Liaoning province. This is Bo Xi Lai. He was just some, he was the heir apparent for China. Now, six weeks later, after that crisis started, the Chinese state declared an end to organ harvesting of death row prisoners, not prisoners of conscience, death row prisoners, over a five year time frame. No mention was made, as I say, of prisoners of conscience. That issue was scrupulously avoided. Uh, more importantly, any attempt at third party verification of this phasing out was uh, rejected. Now, I cannot supply a death count for House Christians. We know they were examined for their organs. I can't supply one for the Uyghurs. I can't supply one for the Tibetans, who were also, busloads of Tibetans were taken in and given very unusual medical examinations while they're in detention. But I do estimate uh, that 65,000 Falun Gong were mur murdered for their organs uh, from 2000 to 2008. Now, what does this all have to do with Ireland? Well, China is the organ repository, clearly, of, of last resort. And Ireland, in spite of its sterling human rights record, is no exception to that. Uh, people come from all over the world to pick up these organs. So my policy recommendation here is simple enough. Down in Australia, the local legislature of New South Wales is currently discussing criminalizing organ tourism, i.e., they don't say it in the bill, but it really it comes out to this. If you go to China and you come back with a new organ, you will be incarcerated. It's as simple as that. Uh, and until the Chinese authorities provide a full accounting of what I consider to be a crime against humanity, this is precisely the model that I believe Ireland should follow. Thank you. Okay. Um, is that, that's it for the moment. So, um, just one question on that, uh, Mr. Goodman. Have you seen any evidence of um, organ tourism out of Ireland to China? I, I, you know, that's one of the big unanswered questions. I won't pretend to have an answer to that. I, I, I would have to say that's one of or our... Or the UK. Uh, well, this is one of our huge failings, uh, is that we're constantly approached by graduate students who claim they want to do something on this, and we say, well, why don't you look into organ tourism from the UK, and we get nowhere. Uh, you know, well, uh, perhaps I could add something about that. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the problem we face is, is not just... Uh, preventing it, but also finding out about it, because there's no compulsory reporting, there's not even a voluntary reporting system. Uh, and some of the legislative reforms that have been introduced around the world require compulsory reforming, like in France or uh, like in Israel. The, uh, there is, we know, transplanted tourism out, out of the British Isles because there are waiting lists and then people disappear from the waiting list without having died. Uh, and, uh, but it, 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 there's no official information about where they've gone, where they got their organs. And I mean, of course, it, it, you can cross a border to get a transplant. It's not necessarily an abuse. It, 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 it depends on whether you're co complicit in uh, uh, organ uh, sourcing, where the source doesn't consent, whether you're buying the organ, uh, and so on. So there's this information vacuum, and, and that's part of uh, the, the lawlessness in this area. Which indeed so. I'll, I'll go over to members now, maybe just to remind members if we could have questions rather than long statements, I, I can do some interaction between the, the, very, the various um, members with, with the uh, witnesses. So, Deputy Brendan Smith. Um, thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you very much for your contributions. It's, it, it gives us a, a clear picture of the frightening situation and the totally unacceptable situation that exists. Um, you mentioned, Mr. Matas, in, your, in the written contribution that we have from you about the proposed human tissue bill and legislation in this country. And you mention um, that it, it's the bill that requires consent for organ sourcing. In, in what practical effect and benefit would that be in dealing with this particular situation? And also, could I ask, um, do you know the way, you obviously want to, to create as much awareness as possible of, of these terrible procedures. Um, and what's been done to so many people. Have, have you been 
um, engaging with the European Parliament, with committees there, or with the political groupings in the European Parliament, or the Council of Europe, because naturally we are a very small uh, state here, as you, as you know, and I think nowadays um, the European Parliament, its committees, its political groupings, obviously represent it, with representatives of 28 member states, is, is, a, is, is in a much better position to put forward a case. And I think there is a regular EU-China dialogue on human rights issues. So I'd just like to know if you have been pursuing, um, if you had the opportunity to participate in those fora. Thank you, okay, Chairman. Just two questions there. So uh, who wants to take those? I think, uh, uh, first of all, consent. Uh, how would it help? Uh, well, the uh, sources of organs in China do not consent. Uh, the, uh, the, the Falun Gong aren't being asked to donate their organs. They're not even being told they're being killed for their organs. Uh, the, uh, they, they are executed through organ extraction. Uh, and uh, the, uh, and I mean, that's, the consequence of my research, and Ethan Gutman has found something similar for the Uyghurs. Uh, even the prisoners sentenced to death, uh, uh, consent isn't meaningful because it's a course of environment. And, and, and the transplantation profession says uh, you shouldn't be sourcing from prisoners sentenced to death as well. Uh, now, uh, I mean, the human trafficking bill, or, or the, there's a, a number of different uh, initiatives uh, kind of going ahead in uh, Ireland. Uh, one of them uh, was the, the one that I mentioned in uh, that talk. Uh, there's also a, the tissue bill, yeah, which hasn't, hasn't been, I mean, it was proposed in 2009. Uh, but there's also the Criminal Law Human Trafficking Act, uh, and there's an amendment before Parliament now that's dealing with this issue. Uh, and there's also a statutory instrument called the European Union Quality and Safety of Human Organs Intended for Transplantation Regulation, which was passed last year. Uh, and all three of these instruments deal with this issue, but none of them deal with the issue in the extraterritorial context. And uh, I did find in Irish legislation uh, uh, an, an example, which was the uh, a bill uh, dealing with female, uh, or legislation dealing with uh, female genital mutilation. It's, it's called the uh, Criminal Justice Female Ju Genital Mutilation Act of 2012, which penalizes uh, 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 participation in female genital mutilation done abroad if the person is Irish uh, and, 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 and comes back into Ireland after the, after the crime. And that's the sort of thing I think we need, uh, or I would suggest uh, uh, Ireland needs, uh, to, to deal uh, with uh, transplant abuse, lack of consent abroad. Uh, I, I mean, uh, they're both horrendous practices, and, 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 and they both could, I think, equally be treated in the same manner in, in terms of legislation. Now, in terms of Europe, uh, well, yes, uh, I, I've been to the European Parliament a couple of times. I've, I've been also uh, to the European uh, Commission. I, I was at the European Parliament actually uh, most recently last uh, December. And, and I said to them uh, what I'm saying to you, uh, extraterritorial legislation. So the European uh, Parliament, they said, well, we don't legislate. We just recommend to member states. If you want actually something to be done, you have to go to the member states. So uh, the, uh, there was a, a um, policy, uh, about a month ago, I was in Italy, and there was a policy uh, a paper that came out of the Italian Bioethics Council, which is part of, uh, the government there, which analyzed this problem from a European perspective and said, across Europe, this is a problem, uh, and it's a problem in Italy. Uh, and and the, uh, <laughs> there are different ways of dealing with this. Uh, you mentioned the, the dialogue, uh, at the uh, China-Europe dialogue. Well, the last dialogue was in June. Uh, and uh, we met with uh, your Department of Foreign Affairs yesterday, and we talked about the dialogue. And uh, it's, I mean, uh, there's a lot of these dialogues, and they're not, frankly, very useful. I mean, they may be useful in showing concerns, but they're not useful in moving China. And, uh, I mean, this is, frankly, it's... It's not just a China problem, it's a global problem. Uh, and uh, I mean, it would be wonderful if we could end all this abuse in China, but uh, it's certainly within our powers to end complicity with that abuse in our own countries. And, 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 uh, and I think uh, 
we should be focusing on, on that. I should say that, I mean, when it comes to transplant tourism, China is not necessarily hostile because after our report came out, they changed their own policy to give priority to locals. I mean, obviously that doesn't solve the problem of sourcing, but it means that you're not coming up against China when you're trying to combat uh, transplant uh, tourism. Uh, well, I could go on, but uh, maybe that's a long enough. Okay. <laughs>